Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to um, the June 1st, 2020, uh, regularly called board meeting uh, by the Atlanta Board of Education. Um, we cannot be together in one room in person uh, for this meeting, but I am pleased that we have been able to gather here virtually for the benefit of Atlanta Public Schools, its students, teachers, and staff. Uh, although we are not their meeting in person at the Alonzo A. Krim Center for Learning Leadership, this board, uh, this meeting will be a formal and official meeting of the Atlanta Board of Education because we expect a quorum of board members to be on this virtual meeting. Uh, but before we can um, be begin with the roll call and, and start with the meeting, I wanted us to take a pause to reflect uh, upon these challenging times our nation has faced not only with the past few months because of COVID-19, uh, but also the past few weeks and days because of the violence of police brutality, civil disobedience and violence. Um, we hope for peace in these times, um, but we also understand and reflect uh, upon the challenges that our black community faces um, given the legacy of racism and oppression um, that has plagued this country for hundreds of years. At this moment, I want us to pause for reflection and in memory of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmed Arbery, um, let us have a moment of silence. Thank you. We will now call the meeting to order. Mr. Gaither, will you please call the roll? Yes, Mr. Chair. Representing Educational District 1, Ms. Leslie Grant. She's on mute, she's here. Representing Educational District 2, Mr. Reto Balden. Representing Educational District 3, Ms. Michelle Olympiadas. Here. Representing Educational District 4, Ms. Nancy Meister. Representing Educational District 5, Ms. Erica Mitchell. Representing Educational District 6 and Board Vice Chair, Ms. Ishe Collins. Present. Representing Educational District at large seat 7, Ms. Candace Wood Jackson. Representing Educational District at large seat 8, Ms. Cynthia Briscoe Brown. Present. Representing Educational District at large seat 9 and Board Chair, Mr. Jason Estevez. Present. Mr. Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. And uh, Aretta Balden message that she is she is present via the the chat. Uh, so I just wanted to that to reflect on the record. Can I get a motion to approve the minutes of the May 4th board meeting? So moved. It's been properly properly moved by Michelle Limpiatis, seconded by Ishe Collins. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Is there a motion to approve the June 1st board meeting agenda? So moved. It's been properly, properly moved by Michelle Olympiadis, seconded by Cynthia Briscoe Brown. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We will now move on to the discussion, uh, to the presentations, to the work session. Dr. Kristarkin, will you please bring the work session items? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for our uh, presentations this evening. We have four of this afternoon. We'll begin with Connie Brown, our executive director for internal audit, who will present her annual report to the board. Um, that'll be lots of fun. Uh, Erica Long, the senior advisor for policy and government affairs, will provide the legislative session update. Then Lisa Bracken, the chief financial officer, will uh, do the monthly update for the current fiscal year 2020 budget but the presentation for the tentative adoption of the fiscal year 2021 budget recommendation uh, is uh, here for tonight. And as a reminder, we're doing a public hearing later this evening uh, as well and our first, um, and our first um, vote for the budget. Uh, we will close our presentations with Angela King-Smith, the Chief Engagement Officer, and she'll be uh, supporting me 
uh, with uh, a report out on the completion of the current district strategic plan that went from 2015 through 2020. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Connie Brown. Welcome, Ms. Brown. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good uh, afternoon. Good Greetings, Board Chairman Estevez, Vice Chair Collins, and members of the board. I'm here today to provide a status update on the 2020 audit plan and to provide an overview of the work that the Office of Internal Compliance has performed to date. The presentation will include um, an overview of the 2020 audit plan, a high level summary of some of the completed projects and highlight um, some of the value OIC continues to bring to the table with our risk-based auditing approach uh, at the end of the presentation, the goal is for you to see how OIC is working with APS leadership to implement thoughtful and cost-effective measures to manage risk, um, to manage and mitigate risk um, for the district. Um, the Office of Employee, um, I'm sorry, the Office of Internal Compliance reports to the Atlanta Board of Education via the Audit Committee. The audit committee oversight ensures independence and in that OIC is organizationally outside of the reporting line for those responsible, uh, responsible areas subject to audit. The independence permits our auditors to perform our work freely and objectively. And to date, there have been no instances where the department's independence has been compromised. The audit committee, as you can see from the chart, um, consists of six members three board members, uh, board members Grant, Mitchell, and Balden, and three community advisors. Our community advisors bring an independent expert knowledge to the board committee, and they provide their services on a volunteer basis. At this time, I would like to acknowledge our community advisors, Mr. Earl Fagan, Mr. Brian Hawkins, and Ms. Leslie Ward for the work they continue to contribute and express my sincere thanks for their time and efforts devoted to the audit committee. I'd also like to express my thanks and appreciation to the entire OIC team and our outside partners uh, that work with us in our efforts to complete our audit plan in any given year. Speaking of our audit plan, um, an annual plan is presented to the audit committee at the start of each school year. Their origin or basis of that plan starts with a risk assessment and we conduct those risk assessments on a three-year cycle. Over that three-year cycle, OIC will augment the assessment based on new information that may come to light and require attention. A risk assessment in its simplest form is a what-if analysis. What could potentially go wrong within the district to prevent the achievement of the district's strategic goals? Other things we consider uh, when putting together our plan is we review external audit reports, we consider suggestions and requests from APS leadership and other interested parties. Any goal uh, for us each year is to complete as much of a plan as possible to get as close to 100% as possible. The 2020 audit plan was approved by the audit committee in June of 2019. And currently we project that we will complete only about 64% of the approved plan by the end of this school year, June 30th. Like many um, audit organizations, the COVID-19 crisis has impacted the completion of our plan. It has resulted in audit start delays and cancellations. Uh, we've had restricted access to physical site locations and access to key uh, staff and personnel. Uh, we've also had restricted access to needed support documentation for field work completion. So the two charts before you now show the status um, of the audit plan as of around April 30th. This was shortly after the district moved to a teleworking um, environment. And the second pie chart um, depicts what we, pre we present, we, pre we expect the audit plan to look like at June 30th. As you can see at August 30th, we felt we were well on our way to actually completing the plan. Between in-process projects and completed projects, we were about 70% complete with the plan and at that point we had only had one cancellation. Um, fast forward to June 30th, we expect um, to only have about 64% of those audits completed and we've actually determined at this point that 27% of the plan, the projects on the 2020 plan will have to be canceled as a result of the COVID-19 um, crisis. Uh, this, the slide you're seeing now um, 
actually shows the breakdown of which projects we estimate we will actually complete and still have in process at, as of June 30th. Uh, key points to note here um, on the canceled audits, you will notice that school audits eight through 12 will be canceled. The cancellation is due to our inability to obtain needed um, records and access the key staff and personnel. The completion of these audits will be dependent on the district's plans for reopening the schools in the upcoming school year. The other canceled project was the parts, the vendor's parts oversight for transportation. And that cancellation actually was not related to COVID-19, but the fact that a new system was implemented in August that would affect how parts inventory were managed. And we felt because of the new system implementation, more time was needed on management side to actually get the system implemented and up and running as a result of new processes. Uh, that had to be put in place because of the implementation. So we expect this audit to be reconsidered up for reconsideration for our 2021 school year. In terms of projects that are in process, um, OIC, like a lot of other departments, is adapting to the challenges created by the teleworking environment and this current crisis. So we are currently performing two of our audits remotely. Uh, using Zoom and team meetings and sharing documentation um, electronically uh, for the completion of our field work whenever feasible. Uh, as for our completed projects, each completed um, audit project is discussed in open session during our scheduled audit committee meetings. Our findings, uh, recommendations, and management corrective action plans are discussed in detail. So those full reports can be found on the OIC website that's noted on this current slide. We had five audits that we were able to present as completed and present to the audit committee up until um, March 31st. <clears throat> and the next couple of slides just um, highlight the scope and the overall conclusions that we formed as a result of that review work. So I'll briefly go through them uh, with you. Uh, the first being pay parity. Uh, the objective of the audit was to determine if the same salary is paid to employees working in the same job with the same pay grade and same years of experience um, and ensuring that these employees are placed on the correct step per the APS uh, salary schedule. Our conclusion was that pay parity is performing effectively and as intended, and our testing actually yielded no findings. There were a few observations that we shared with management, but the key point here is that pay parity is performing effectively and our testing yielded no findings as a result of that review. Our next work um, project was construction risk and controls assessment. And the objective of this process or this project was to assess the controls of the construction project life cycle to include assessing planning, the planning process, competitive bidding practices, change order processing, uh, monitoring and reporting, capital approvals and expenditures. And our overall conclusion for that particular project was that we felt construction projects were being managed using industry best practices. And we did note um, some areas were operating effectively. We also did note some um, areas for improvement and we offered recommendations and management accepted those recommendations and created corrective action plans to address those um, issues. Our next audit was parking lot funds and cash management. And um, the objective there was to determine if controls were operating effectively to provide reasonable assurance that proper stewardship of funds was occurring. Um, based on the review work we performed, our overall assessment was that cash management processes and those internal controls need to be strengthened to make certain funds are properly tracked, accounted for, and safeguarded. Again, we made multiple recommendations. We discussed them with management, and they, were, they agreed to address those issues uh, in the coming months. The next audit was our athletic review, and our overall objective there was to evaluate management's controls in place to ensure effective and efficient operations of the district's athletic program with the focus on three particular areas, uh, those being health and safety, 
eligibility and overall program management. And our conclusions based on our review work was that um, improvement was needed in all three of those areas. We felt efficiencies and operations could be improved with the execution of established policies and procedures and implementation of internal controls around eligibility determination and records retention. Uh, the final piece we presented to the audit committee was our PCART continuous audit. And our objective there was to determine if PCART transactions were processed outside of the APS purchasing card guidelines. Um, it's noted that in spite of the fact that our PCART guidance mirrors industry best practices, we felt that PCART monitoring oversight needed to be strengthened. And I also wanted to point out that throughout our continuous um, audit, we did not identify any fraudulent activity. So I think that that is important to note um, in this case. Um, as a result of all of the audit work that we do, um, over the past three and a half years, the Office of Internal Compliance has um, offered up over 250 plus recommendations to management, and the majority of those recommendations have been accepted. However, um, it's important to note right now that um, as of April 30th, we have about 43 active recommendations that are open. And those recommendations can be open for a variety of reasons. Um, one could be that the, my office has not had an opportunity to actually validate management's implementation of their plans. And this is not to imply that management has not actually implemented the changes. It simply means my team has not had an opportunity to actually confirm the plans were actually implemented. Other reasons they continue to be open could be that uh, the corrective action plans implementation didn't pass our follow-up review efforts. And the last piece would be that some of those corrective action plan due dates are scheduled to occur in the future, sometime after June 30th of 2020. As you look at the slide, you'll note that we've got um, about 200 suspended school audit recommendations. And we did that with the approval of the audit committee. Uh, we actually suspended those recommendations in an effort to allow the CFO and her team to implement an accounting project training plan that was rolled out during the previous um, school year. And uh, if we go back and take a look at the 2020 plan, we actually included 12 audits so that we can go back and we could actually go back and assess the effectiveness of the training that um, the accounting group put into place. And to finally get to the, the 43 number, um, my team was able to validate at least 16 of those corrective action plans by management were indeed implemented in accordance with their stated plans. As we move to the next slide, this slide simply shows a breakdown of those 258 recommendations by audits. Um, OIC will continue to incorporate uh, follow-up work in our future audit plans, and we will report the results of our follow-up work to the audit committee during our regularly scheduled audit committee meetings, which are generally the third Thursday of every month. Um, next slide, please. In addition to the audit and the follow-up work that my team performs, we also manage the ethics and compliance hotline. And um, as a reminder, the hotline is open for the public, uh, including APS employees, to report concerns that relate to fraud, waste, and abuse type issues. Our experience continues to show that the majority of the concerns that come through the hotline relate to personnel issues or issues that are generally managed by the Office of Employee Relations, which is a department within human resources. However, based on the 11 cases that um, were assigned to the Office of Employee, um, the Office of Internal Compliance, um, three have been closed to date. And one of those was substantiated. The other two were unsubstantiated claims. And the other eight will remain open until we have access to supporting documentation and or um, um, staff that we need to actually close those projects out. Um, next slide, please. Um, I believe we skipped one. Um, thank you. Um, this is my favorite slide, and I'm probably prejudiced because it's it, it's a culmination of the work um, that our team has done. Um, but it is um, some of the value add that 
we've brought to the table um, this current year with the projects that we've um, completed. Um, the first one is we did identify an opportunity, and I, I promise you I won't read the entire slide, but we did identify an opportunity for leadership to optimize earnings on invested funds. This came about as a result of the construction project risk and controls assessment that we were doing. Um, we identified the fact that um, um, holding cash balances in accounts with um, the highest yielding um, returns could potentially yield approximately $600,000 in additional investment earnings. And I will place a caveat here. Um, the scope of our work for this audit was not financial in nature. This was something that we ran across and we just felt it was important to share this with management. Um, the calculation was a quick, um, a quick calculation, it wasn't very detailed, but it was enough to bring some context to the actual finding. Um, we made some recommendations to the CFO's office and they agreed to look into um, managing those funds uh, differently whenever possible. One of the other um, advantages or values that we brought was when we were conducting the parking lot fund process um, and cash management review, we actually researched and identified an alternative option for collecting parking lot funds. The alternative method would have eliminated the use of cash and minimized um, the theft of funds potentially. Uh, management um, agreed to look at our research. Um, we actually had quotes and um, we had a lot of information that management could actually start um, the process of considering the option. Uh, we also know that as we come up with these recommendations, we don't know all of the nuances that schools and departments face. So again, this was just a first stab at the feasibility of doing this and collecting these funds differently. Um, during our PCART continuous audit, one of the things we did is we created our methodology for reviewing PCART transactions, we actually developed some analytical test scripts through the use of Tableau uh, so that we could get greater coverage of the PCART transactions activity. And um, we found it very helpful and we've offered to share that information with the CFO and her PCART administration team um, as well. When we looked at the PCART activity, for one quarter, we had over 7,400 transactions. So as a result of those, those data analytic test scripts we developed, we were able to um, focus our review um, to key in on some of those key areas that we that tend to be issues when you have P cards in use, split transactions, gift card purchases, those type things. So again, we're very proud of the work that we've done. We believe we've added an immense amount of value to the district with the work that we continue to do um, every year. And um, at this point, I said, I'm not gonna read the entire slide, but um, that ends my presentation and I'm open to answer any questions. Um, that the board members might have for me at this time. So I'm going to hop in really quickly. Jason had to jump off, jump, jump off for a quick call. Um, but before we do open up to questions, wanted to see if Leslie Grant, who chairs the audit committee, wants to say a few things, a few words, or, or anything, and then we'll take questions. Yep. Um, thank you very much. I just, I did want to. Um, just take the opportunity to thank Connie. Um, I think there's, uh, through this department and this work, there's been a great deal of assurance that's provided to the district. Um, I am hopeful that we will uh, continue um, to do this work. Um, I think there's a, a lot of room for growth here and uh, um, just a lot of different areas that um, assurance can be provided. And um, want to make sure that the uh, board and the public's uh, understanding about what this function does for the system is um, is well understood. Um, again, I appreciate Connie, your team's work, and know that those audits can be found online. And certainly encourage folks to um, tune into the meetings when we have them to look at the catalog of um, past meetings we have had, and to um, certainly post any questions you have at any time. Um, but again, just thank you very much for the work. There's a lot of um, a lot of pieces to puzzles that um, just have to be put together for an organization such as this. And um, I appreciate you helping with that, Connie. Thank you. Great, great. Thanks, Leslie. I also wanted to give Dr. Dr. Kostarfin 
um, moments as well before we open up for any questions. Great, thank you. I just uh, wanted to uh, say to Connie and her entire team, which is so small, um, and for a district our size, we know that over the years, it just never seems that we have a great budget year. Uh, and so we're always skim, you know, cutting and slimming uh, the budget. And so you do so much with so little. I don't think anybody in the public probably rec realizes that. Um, but having an internal auditor is a great uh, check and balance for a public entity like ours, and you do it on a shoestring. So I just want to say thank you. I know that APS is far from perfect, uh, and, um, and there are so many things that we still need to clean up and do, but you have the patience of a saint. You have always come, you know, really, you sit down with us. Um, you answer every question when people don't understand or need more feedback. And, um, and I just want the board to know and the public to know um, that you take your job seriously. And I think it's been a huge value add to Atlanta Public Schools. And one day when there's, <laughs> there's ever a, an economic moment for that department to get actually funded well, right, to the level that it needs to be, I know you'll be able to do so much more and APS will be better for it. And also you've just been a delight to work with. I wanna say thank you so much, Connie, for um, being there for APS and digging into the mess because that's what you do all day, every day, into our mess and sorting us out and just making us stronger. Um, and I've been in many organizations where it's always been a conflict between the administration and internal audits, um, but that has not been my experience and that's uh, because of your leadership, so thank you. Thank you, I appreciate those kind of words. That's great, thank you, thanks Connie. Um, any questions? have a quick question, uh, Ishe. Yes, go ahead, Michelle. Thank you. Connie, thank you and um, for the great presentation and you know, former member of, of the uh, audit committee, really appreciate uh, the dedication that your team put forth. I was just kind of curious to know, uh, slightly piggybacking off of Dr. Starpin's remarks, what, I, what would ideally the department look like if we were to, you know, find the funds, so to speak, uh, over time. What, what ideally do you need to have a successful, not that you're not successful now, but to have a, a more vibrant or, you know, more impactful department to uh, really ensure that our taxpayer, our taxpayer funds are being utilized to the, the best of their abilities. Um, with that said, I know there's like, you have three people, right? There's have, three of you? I, I actually have two lead internal auditors. I have an administrative assistant and we have some outside partners that um, when budget permits, I'm able to use um, their expertise to help us complete the plan. Uh, your question is an interesting one and I'm not sure when you ever asked the supervisors, how much do you really need? Uh, <laughs> it's always, a lot. Um, so I have given it some thought and um, to do the work that we do and to do more of it, it's not like our team needs a lot of tools. I need resources. I need people to physically go out and do the work. Um, I would love to have an on-site um, IT um, auditor um, on staff full-time. Um, but for now, um, I am working successfully with, with this co-sourcing partnership with some of our business, uh, with some of our business partners. So I'm able to call on skill sets when needed. Mm -hmm. So I can't tell you the exact number because I don't know that there's ever going to be enough people. Uh, I think with any department, we have to prioritize based on the resources that we have. So. Could I get more work done and be more effective if I had more resources and more people? Absolutely. Uh, but actually, I, I don't have a number in mind um, in Fair terms enough. of what that would look like. So I don't know if that, that, if that answers your question or if that's helpful for you. It, 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 I think, I, I guess what you said makes complete sense. You're prioritizing and addressing what you can given what you have. Um, and if you did have more, you could do more. And I think that's fair enough. Okay. 
So thank you. I want to make sure I make it sound like I closed out on that. Yeah, no problem. Maria, did you, Maria, did you want to respond? To yes, uh, Madam Vice Chair, members of the board, while it's not my department, I do know like how much, um, how long, like when, when Connie has a plan and we really do need, for example, um, someone to go in and look at uh, something that might pop that is, I'm, I'm going to go with, um, uh, with athletics. Right. I mean, because that's that's always one. IT is another. I mean, like pick something that almost every school does. Uh, it's it's across the entire system. And I just don't see how if you really want to go through the cycle of the things that she's you know, proposed, if you look at the slides that were back about four slides, I mean, it's I mean, her department needs to be twice the size at minimum. I mean, it just um it's the same people under the same um demand doing really big audits that for a district like APS especially when people are making and I know like it sounds like it's not a lot if out of the anonymous tip line you know they get 10 percent and the rest are employees but when people bring issues forward it you have to stop and like do a big you know, drill down on something that may not have even been on the list. And so even if there was um, a way to, you know, just double the size, spread out the audits, she knows what I mean when I say like, it's, a, um, you know, you're, you're trying to kind of protect the, not protect the district in, in, a, in an inappropriate sense, but you're trying to make the district better faster as she's finding things and then the other piece which i am incredibly appreciative of is the idea that they give you a chance as they're finding things i, I you know she talks to me like you want to try to make it better faster not let the train go off the track and so to have that kind of um coverage in the district i mean we have you know, splost alone is a is its own business i mean it is so huge um, and and the and I just think like high school sports or just um, dealing with auditing uh, uh, the the um, the budget of a of a high school is a small business. I mean, so like it's just very few people with a lot of demands, and um, and they and it's hard. They almost have to do like selective litmus testing. It's very hard to be able to do a complete study. So I would hope that. When the whenever we get to a halfway decent budget budget year, that's that at least you know it's um, you you do a study of like size systems or uh, like 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 size um, uh, businesses and create an internal audit department that can manage uh, the size and the and the weight of what APS is and we just have so many holes we could fall through. Um, because so many people are touching resources um, that you, you just have to have, if you're going to have an internal audit department, give them the strength to do what they need to do. So I, I mean, I would fully support it. We've just always, every year something horrible happens, it seems, in our budget scenario. So we never get to uh, address the issues that Connie, you know, has raised over the years. So I hope that in the future it can be um, expanded. Thank you. Does anyone have any additional questions? Well, thank you so much, Connie. We truly appreciate your, you and the team, all of the team hard work. And I echo Michelle as a former member of the audit um, committee, just seeing the great work that has happened over the years and the progress that has been made. So please, um, thank you so much for the presentation and continue to let us know what we can support and, um, expand, and expand the great work that you guys are doing. So thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to share today. Thank you. Dr. Kostarf, I'm going to switch it back over to you for our next presentation. Great. Thank you so much. Our next presentation is Erica Long, our Senior Advisor for Policy and Government Affairs. Um, the 2020 legislative session has been a victim of the coronavirus as well. So um, we still have priorities, though. She's been up at the Capitol. Uh, throughout the whole experience and still participating even, I think it was uh, last 
was it today or last week? I can't even remember, but mm -hmm. she's still doing her work every day, even if she can't be there in person. Um, so I'll turn it over to you, uh, Ms. Long, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Karstarfin. Good afternoon, board members, and thank you for the opportunity to update you all on the 2020 legislative session. Um, most years, this June presentation to you is a recap of a legislative session that has completed sine die. Um, but like, like everything else in our lives, there has been a major impact to the legislative work from COVID-19. The legislature actually suspended its session um, in mid-March, a few days after we moved to telework, teleschooling format here for the district. So they have not met in person since then. When the legislature suspended, um, next slide please, we were at day 28 of the 40 day session. Um, they had not settled on the FY 2021 budget. You will recall that setting a balanced budget every year by July 1st is the only constitutional requirement of the legislature. Um, but in response to COVID, they suspended their session about 28 days in. Um, the last day I was at the Capitol was I think March 12th. On March 16th, there was a special session of the legislature where they came in to ratify Governor Kemp's executive orders during this COVID crisis um, and to formalize their suspension. And we don't expect the House and Senate to come back until next week on June 11th. Um, that means that a lot of the major legislative initiatives and bills that were being discussed and planned for pre-COVID are in a state of hiatus or are likely not to happen at all. Um, you will of course hear more from our CFO about the budget outlook, but of course there is a state legislative component to that. Um, and Lisa will give you more specifics on reductions to state education funding, including QBE, but also in the form of reductions to pre-K funding, Perkins grant, early childhood of about 14%. Um, just last week, the Senate Appropriations Committees um, held meetings with the various state agencies to talk through their budget proposals and how they will implement these across the board 14% cuts. Um, Pre-COVID, when the legislature was in session, as Dr. Car Carsarfin said, I had an active presence at the Capitol um, working with our colleagues across other school districts and education agencies to advocate for our legislative priorities. Um, Pre-COVID, there was talk about a $1,000 teacher pay raise. We don't anticipate that happening now. Pre-COVID, there was a lot of legislative work around expanding student vouchers. Um, given the economic condition of the state, I don't see that happening at all. Um, there was an annexation bill that would have impacted this district um, that did not go very far pre-COVID. Um, and we don't expect there to be any action that picks up on that. Of course, responding to annexations is one of our legislative priorities. There was not a lot of legislative work around flexibility, autonomy, next slide please, um, charter districts. Um, and it remains to be seen to what degree the legislature will do anything that's not budget related for these last 11 days of the session. Um, I have heard rumors that there is a desire to keep the entire legislature engaged in the process. And of course, when you're talking about budget making on the state scale, it's usually just those budget committees that are doing a lot of the work. So there may be some opportunities for other issues to come up, but it really remains to be seen what will be on the governor and the speaker's agenda beyond the FY21 budget. A little bit of a good news development. Um, earlier in the session, your local legislation that would have changed the charter to the school districts um, to allow for staggered board member elections was passed by the House. Um, it was passed by the, the House Atlanta delegation and passed by the full House just before the COVID break. Um, and it remains to be, determined, to be determined whether it will make it onto the Senate docket when the legislature comes back next week. Um, that's the bill that was local legislation that was sponsored by um, Representative Betsy Holland. So we're hopeful that there may possibly be a chance to get something done on it. One major education bill that actually went all the way through the process and was signed into law was of course, reform to the dual enrollment program. We updated you about changes to dual enrollment 
um, throughout the session. Um, this is something that carried over from last year. Over last summer, there was a lot of work outside of session to make changes to dual enrollment that will make it easier for the state to afford. Um, there are some restrictions and limitations on student involvement in the program, but we're hopeful that we will have some form of dual enrollment, even though it will be a bit smaller. Next slide, please. Um, this has been an unusual session. Um, I have I work with lobbyists with many, many years of experience from all across the board, and they say that they have never seen anything like this. Um, but we will continue the work that we do, um, attending legislative hearings, attending the session itself, the weekly Atlanta and Fulton County delegation meetings at which we presented very early in the session. Um, we stay in close contact with other school districts and lobbyists and education agencies who have similar interests to us. Um, a big part of our work is just exchanging information and keeping up to date on what's happening. And then of course the COVID-19 crisis itself has opened up an entirely new vein of government affairs work. Um, a big part of our work advocating for this district has required us to um, reach out to and be in touch with our federal representatives and senators. Um, of course, you are all are aware of all of the CARES Act and COVID funding that has come down through Congress. I was just on a call earlier this afternoon um, talking about the potential for some supplemental COVID funding, hopefully in a, in a fifth supplemental bill. Um, work on the state level, being in communication with the governor's office, with the state education secretary about needs and questions of the school district, and just keeping track of this new environment and how every level of government has responded to it and provided resources and information for the school district. So we have 11 more, legislat 11 more legislative days um, starting next week. Um, we are hopeful that there will be a balanced budget passed before July 1st. Um, and look forward to the potential for any other positive developments on the priorities of Atlanta Public Schools. I am happy to take questions. Right. Any board members have any questions? Hey, Shay. Yes. Hey. Um, Thank you, Erica. I appreciate all the work on that. Have, um, have you heard anything at all about, um, I guess uh, our funding is based on um, student counts, October and March um, on enrollment, you know, how many students are enrolled at each school, we get money from the state that way. Have you heard anybody talking about doing a waiver or a, maybe some hold harmless counts from March or something that roll forward? Um, I know there's a lot of talk and concern about students opting and parents opting not to send students back and how, how that all is going to look since our money is funded by seats. I think there are people who are starting to worry about that issue. Um, just understanding the likelihood, as you said, that some people will make the decision not to send their children to school in the fall. Um, I have not heard of potential um, solutions for that issue. Um, but that's something that I will happily take up um, with some of our other school districts and organizations that we work with and see if this is something where we can maybe make a united front on the question. It's, it is an important issue. Um, and you know, ideally there may would be some type of hold harmless provision, um, but I'm happy to take that up and report back to the board. Okay, I mean, we can all, all see, I know it's a fear on the national level as well, the, all the commercials coming up from the, you know, hey, homeschool is great. Um, just there's a lot of competition to um, siphon off students and um, it's, it, it's not going to be good. So even thank at, you. Even at, at the, uh, there's an appropriations committee hearing last week and one of the senators made the suggestion, well, can't we just save a lot of money by letting everyone go virtual, sure. um, which which is a huge, of course, cultural shift. Um, but I think you're right that there are people who are considering doing things very differently going forward. Um, so I will take that question up and report back. Thank you, Shay. I have a quick question as well. Um, thank you. Thank you, Erica, for the great presentation. Are we sure, is the 14% set? Did they ever take a vote on that? I kept up with it for a minute and then it, I didn't keep up with it anymore. Um, or is that something that you think will be part of the discussion coming up on when they reconvene on the 11th? 
nothing in the legislative world is set in stone until it's passed by both houses and signed by the governor. Um, so 14% was that number, that target number that was provided to all state agencies and local education agencies um, from the governor's office, from the legislative leadership. Um, but a budget, of course, is a document that has negotiation built into it. Um, sure. I've heard a senator say directly that he does not believe that an across the board cut is the right way to solve this budget issue. Um, I don't know how much influence he will have over that question. Um, sure. There's still the issue of whether the legislature will decide to raise revenue. I mean, if you're looking at budget shortcuts, mm -hmm. drastic budget short calls, shortfalls, um, the economic environment that we're all in right now, there's been quite a bit of discussion about the potential of raising the tobacco tax. You know, this mm -hmm. is a sales tax on tobacco that could make a lot of money for the state, I've been told. Um, it may not hurt people's pockets in the same way as some other revenue, ra revenue raisers might would, um, but you do have to also look at the political climate. Um, the entire legislature is up for re-election um, with their primary races in June and then their general election in November. Um, so you do have to wonder what the appetite would be for a revenue raiser. For some, it may be safer to call for an across the board cut that's applied to everyone on the same level and sort of rip the bandage off that way. But nothing is definite until that budget is signed. Thank you. Thank you for the detailed response. Yeah, Eric, I think you answered my question. I was going to ask about, I've been hearing a lot of, there's been a lot of conversations about the state raising revenue to meet the gap on the shortfalls and, and understanding what that looks like. Have you heard anything else beyond besides um, the tobacco, you know, potential, you know, that the potential tobacco tax? Well, just curious on what are some of the other ways that the state has I mean they they could raise the income tax. I don't think that's likely because we just had an income tax cut on the state level last year. Um, and that is a priority for um, so many of the political players at the Capitol. It seems that that tobacco tax, um, sales tax surcharge may be the, safe, the safest route for them to take. Um, but, you know, it really just depends on how the economic picture continues to unfold. Um, and we're, of course, we're talking right now about FY21, but as our own CFO has advised you all, this is just the beginning of a process that's going to have a, quite a bit of economic contraction for the next coming years. Um, so the legislature has the luxury of looking right now just at this year, but it's not inconceivable that there may be some changes on down the line. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Maria, before we move on, Dr. Sarf, before we move on to the next presentation, would you like to add anything to this portion? Um, I just wanted to add that uh, that I I think that Eric along along with Nina Gupta and uh, Lisa Bracken, the CFO, the general counsel, and our um, lead policy advisor, senior policy advisor, have done an amazing job of anticipating how things could have been interpreted, interpreted um, that allowed APS to stay a couple of steps ahead of some of the things that uh, others had to react to. Um, I especially wanna thank uh, the Nelson Mullins team led by Nina um, to get in front of uh, how um, things were gonna be potentially interpreted related to the CARES Act, uh, which was um, something that unless you are uh, really, you know, combing through every single detail, um, it would it would have been impossible for a layperson or or even a superintendent. I mean, you just aren't looking at the details like that. And um, and I think that uh, that our legal team did a great job. Uh, Lisa jumped on it right away and started um, analyzing what that might mean for us, uh, and allowed um, Erica and others uh, with our uh, our task force. Uh, to get in front of um, being able to sort through the, the resources and the dollars um, so that we could have a plan to talk to our community about 
internally with staff and also externally. So I just wanted to say the three of them have worked hand in hand together. Um, Erica, thank you for your leadership in this. I know that a couple of those nights were super late um, and you have a baby at home uh, who isn't such a baby anymore, but, um, but he loves his mama. So thank you for doing that and for staying on top of things for us. And Nina, Gupta, um, you and your team, I appreciate everything you did to um, help us get in front of the CARES Act. So um, I just wanted to shout them out for a job well done in a crazy legislative session. So um, good job. Great, great. Thank you. Yes, great job. Thank you. Hearing on. Dr. Kassarf, and we are ready for the next presentation. Yeah, so speaking of staying one step ahead, I'm going to ask uh, Lisa Brecken, the Chief Financial Officer, to join us. She has the monthly financial update, um, <clears throat> but she also has, excitingly enough, uh, the fiscal year 2021 uh, tentative recommendation. We still have so much work to do. Little things pop up all the time. Um, so this budget won't be done until the last day when we're taking that final vote. Um, but as we work through things, uh, Lisa's leadership has been essential. Um, welcome, Ms. Bracken. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Karstarfman. Today, I'll be presenting three topics related to finance. First, I'll be providing you with the financials for FY 2020 for all activities occurring in the months of July through April within the Consolidated General Fund. Next, I'll briefly cover some of the adjustments to the FY2020 current budget. And then finally, I'll end with a recommendation for the tentative FY2021 budget, which will be before you this evening for action. With the next four slides, we will cover the FY20 financials for the first 10 months of the fiscal year. The financial position for the current year is still strong. So far, we've collected about 92.01% of the total resources budgeted with local collections exceeding the budget at 100.87%. State at 77.07% and other, which includes the Fund 150 Title I transfer in as 62.61%. We're currently tracking ahead of pace for revenue collections in local and state as compared to this point in the last year. Last year by May, we had collected a total of 89.98% of total revenue, and this year we're already at 92.01%. We will continue to monitor the pace of collections throughout this year, but expect to collect more revenue than we budgeted, which will help us to restore fund balance and offset reductions for the next fiscal year. On slide five, we see the budget to actual expenditures so far for FY 2020. We've currently spent 77.77% of budgeted allotments and spending in all functions is appropriate for this time of the year. Slide six represents the current spending trend for FY20 against the 19 trend. The overall spend is on pace with and slightly lagging the previous year spend. By this time last year, we had spent 79.77% of budgeted allocations and this year we're at 77.77. As mentioned last month, in an attempt to further grow fund balance, we have moved forward our requisition and PCAR deadlines to May 1st and implemented a spending slowdown that was effective May 1st through the remainder of the fiscal year. We're only allowing personnel expenditures and those expenses that are directly in support of our COVID-19 response or our critical expenditures to prepare for the day one opening for next year. We plan that over the final month of FY20, we will continue to slow spending and increase available fund balance. Detailed financials can be found in agenda item 12.04. We have no budget adjustments for your consideration today. However, agenda item 12.06 does include the detailed information report for special revenue adjustments, less than $1 million that occurred in May. And at this time, I'll transition from FY20 to FY21 for an overview of the tentative budget recommendation. Much of this presentation has been discussed at last month's board meeting and in great detail at the May 21st Budget Commission meeting. So I'll be brief in my remarks and I'll leave plenty of time for your questions. Our amended timeline for budget adoption means that the attentive, the attentive adoption, including public hearing number one, moved from May to today. We'll be holding two virtual public meetings to discuss the budget proposal and we'll bring the final budget back for your adoption on June 22nd and, and hold our public hearing number two. The millage timeline is still TBD and will likely occur sometime in July. The budget is predict predicated on the rate staying at the same 20.740 mils. 
We're currently planning for what may be the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. We don't anticipate huge losses in local revenue for this year, but are increasing our assumptions of the amount uncollected. Major impacts for local revenue could be FY 22 and 23. We're currently developing a budget with the assumption that the reduction to state programs will be the 14% that have impacted the state and will impact the state QB allocations and other state funded grants by 14%. Please know that we still have received no firm revenue figures. If additional informa information does become available over the next two weeks, we'll incorporate that into our final budget recommendation. Otherwise, we may need to bring budget amendments early into the next fiscal year. The chart on slide seven um, shows a graph that demonstrates how the impact to our primary revenue streams tends to lag the actual recessionary events. Therefore, we are planning for even sharper declines in future fiscal years. APS has a longstanding practice of maintaining a fund balance of 7.5% of revenue, but below the statutorily required cap of 15%. If revenue and expenditure trends stay on pace and with the expenditure slowdown for the final months of FY20, we are optimistic we can grow fund balance by 27.5 million from 85.04 million to 122.54 million. That's the dashed line on the chart. More conservatively, we estimate growing fund balance by 16.6 million to 102 million, and that's the solid line. We did survey staff after a virtual meeting focused on budget at the end of April. Overall, we heard from 848 res responses. The vast majority were school-based staff and 83% were CLL or other. For question number three, the ranking question, cut employee travel was the most popular option with 47% of people putting that as their first choice. Any reduction in pay through mandatory or voluntary furloughs or reduced paid days were the least popular. Other suggestions for cuts and reductions over the next fiscal year aligned to programs outside the traditional school day and responses emphasizing protecting jobs and salaries. The survey provided many great suggestions that we will continue to look into, especially for multi-year planning. For the last month, we have been working to close a $60 million gap in the expenditure budget we had originally built for FY21 and the new revenue projections, which include a 14% reduction in state revenue. Cuts were implemented in order to preserve jobs and employees' salaries. Ultimately, through targeted strategies, we were able to reduce the expenditure budget by $31 million. We're still reviewing additional shifts we may be able to make to the CARES Act and are reviewing other reduction strategies in an attempt to, re to rely less heavily on the fund balance. However, even with our assumptions for growing fund balance for the current year, even with the $30 million usage of fund balance, our fund balance will be between eight and a half and 10% of expected expenditures. We'll continue to work through final adoption to alleviate additional pressure from the fund balance. The next few slides will show the charts you are the most familiar with when reviewing the budget proposal and reflect a balanced budget that is 2.65% less than the current year's budget. This chart shows the consolidated general fund expenditures budget by function grouping. While the largest dollar decrease from the previous year is in direct instruction, primarily because of the delay of a textbook adoption, the overall percentage of the budget dedicated to direct instruction continues to increase from 65.1% to 65.81% of the total budget. The overall budget is down 22.9 million from the, pre, from the current year. This chart shows the consolidated general fund expenditure budget by object grouping. As you can see, salaries were not impacted by our overall budget reduction strategies. Benefits experienced a sizable decrease, mostly because of the reduction in the state teacher retirement system rate from 21.14% to 19.06%. The largest overall reduction was to the supply budgets, again, because of the delay in textbooks and the roll off of a one-time safety and security grant. Slides 20 through 21 contain our typical alignment of budget recommendations to the budget parameters. The district continues to commit resources to ongoing investments, investments such as the turnaround strategy, flexibility and autonomy, the Atlanta College and Career Academy, early learning in pre-K, a robust talent strategy, and the general employee pension plan. While sizable new investments in these strategies were not made in this year, we also avoided making cuts in these areas because of the current revenue pressures. There were decreases to the central office per portion of the turnaround budgets that were made to prepare the district for new investments in the new strategic plan, but this was done in the original budget planning process. 
For the FY 2021 budget, APS continued allocations through Student Success Funding, or SSF, and added a new weight for concentration of poverty. Approximately $280 million was distributed to schools through this model, which represents about 70% of all traditional school funding. In another major step towards equity, schools are divided into two bands, those with direct certification of 70% or higher and those below, and assigned average salaries based on the teachers within that band. This slide represents new initiatives that were planned for FY21. The appendix highlights some of the investments that were planned in alignment with these parameters prior to the current revenue crisis. While these parameters have not been fully funded for FY21, they will remain a focus and priority for future budgetary decisions. The total budget is not just the general fund. The following slides give a brief overview of the other funds within the APS budget. By far the most immediate impact of the economic showdown, slowdown will be on the sales tax, including our SPLOST. We would anticipate de steep declines in sales tax collections for as long as the economy is frozen and experts don't know how quickly sales will rebound. New revenue from the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security or CARES Act was passed by Congress and signed into law on March 27th. We anticipate access to approximately 22.95 million in reimbursable federal aid. The next 10 slides of my presentation present our assumptions for the special revenue, SPLOST, nutrition, and student activity fund budgets. Title I provides financial assistance based on the high percentage of children from low-income families to help ensure that all children meet challenging state academic standards. We plan to continue with a very successful consolidated funds pilot, which allows much more flexibility with these dollars. The projected Title I budget for FY21 is $27 million. We've pushed in 16.7 million to consolidated school budgets. Another 3.7 was allocated to non-traditional schools and approximately 7 million will be allocated to our required set-asides. Traditional school budgets that include Title I still maintain a holdback that will be released when final numbers from the state become available. Title II funding is designed to ensure the equitable distribution of highly experienced, highly qualified, and highly effective teachers and leaders. For FY21, we estimate funding to remain around 2.57 million. Title IV is intended to improve students' academic achievement by increasing the capacity to provide all students with access to well-rounded education, improve school conditions for student learning, and improve the use of technology to support student achievement. For FY21, we estimate funding to remain around 2 million plus carryover from the cancellation of our summer power-up program. I've discussed the CARES Act earlier in this presentation. As a reminder, these funds can support offsetting the cost of school meals, hero pay, logistical costs, remote learning, facilities, and equipment sanitation and PPE, mental health, supplemental learning, professional development, and at-risk student populations. The estimated CARES Act allocation is 22.9 million, and funds from the CARES Act have been earmarked for the following categories. Although exact dollar amounts will not be solidified before a reopening model is decided upon. Currently, we expect private schools to qualify for two to 2.5 million of APS CARES Act funds. From what is remaining, we plan to earmark funds for the replacement of student devices and media center books, compensatory services, personal protective equipment and other operational costs related to COVID-19 response, digital learning, hazard pay, and any additional costs related to various models for reopening school next year, depending on the actual cost of other spending categories. The purpose of Title VI-B is to assist states with providing special education to related services and related services to children with disabilities. The Title VI-B for FY21 award is estimated to remain at 10.5 million. The National Lunch and Breakfast Programs are federally funded meal programs that provide well-balanced meals at free, reduced, and paid meal eligibility statuses to children each school day. Atlanta Public Schools also participates in the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program, which is pending suspension due to COVID-19. The National School Program for FY21 is estimated to earn approximately 35 million. The SPLOS program is a one cent sales tax used by school systems for the construction and renovation of schools, upgrading building infrastructure, security and safety systems, athletic fields, refresh school bus fleets, playgrounds, HVAC and critical projects, and, and technical technology infrastructure and equipment. The SPLOS 17 receipts for FY21 are estimated to be 93 million. 
Um, we will monitor incoming revenues carefully uh, in accordance with completed and planned projects. School activity funds are bank accounts at individual schools under the control of school principals or club advisors. We expect to maintain this budget at 4.5 million. And finally, slide 33 presents the all funds chart for the FY 2021 tentative budget adoption. For your consideration for tentative adoption is a budget with a total appropriation plus available fund balance of $1,253,705,913. And that concludes my presentation and I'm available for any questions you might have at this time. Thanks, Lisa. Jason has joined us. So I'm going to turn it back over to Jason. Thanks, Ishe. Uh, I think Cynthia has the first question. Yeah, yeah, Lisa, if you could go back to slide 20. Ooh, <laughs> all those slides. <laughs> Thank you. Just a, a couple of questions on that one, um, specifically on uh, the, these, I think, will be related to the top three items on that page. Um, can you clarify on, on the first right-hand column, uh, can you clarify what that means, 7.5 million invested in the turnaround strategy, excluding partner schools? Absolutely. So, we have $7.5 million that has been allocated and earmarked for turnaround in our traditional schools, as well as a central office overhead costs. We say excluding partner schools on this slide because their share of turnaround is actually budgeted for in their total allocation. Um, so if you are looking for that in the, um, in the budget documents, you would see their partner allocation includes the turnaround supplement. Okay. Um, and what is the recommendation for that this year? So I'm, I'm kind of looking for a year over year here. Right. I'd have to pull up the, um, I have the, uh, another document I can pull up and get that answer for you. For our traditional schools, there were no changes to the overall allotments for um, turnaround. We did do some reductions in the central office supports for the turnaround strategy. And because our partner schools receive a share of the overall turnaround budget, which includes both that money that is pushed out to our traditional schools, schools plus the central office, there was a slight decrease um, in their allocation for that turnaround portion. However, um, I know that Matt Underwood, our executive director of the innovations office is continuing to look through how to um, help support that program for our partner schools as well. Uh, our traditional schools felt no impact to, to the their turnaround allocations for this year, unless they were moving through different categories, so different tiers of support, um, then the, the allocations might change based on that. Okay. But a, a turnaround school that is also a partner school has, has their 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 fair share, their allocated portion of the turnaround funds built into their regular partner budget? Yes, that's correct. As um, And that's been negotiated through our contract with the partner schools. Okay, mm -hmm. that's fine. Um, and on the next item down on that right-hand side, um, just how do those numbers compare to FY 2020? So the way that we push these dollars into the schools, um, when we initially consolidated um, uh, the, our funding models to create the student success funding model, um, we had about $30,000 per school that was allocated for cluster funds. And so that equaled about $3 million for the district. That $3 million was swept and put into SSF and we continue to fund that through SSF um, so that schools are receiving those dollars flexibly, but it's more equitably distributed. It's not the $30,000 per school that we started with four years ago when we first started cluster funds. Um, flexibility funds is the equivalent of a teacher's salary per school. Um, that one is equal to about $9 million. Again, when we first 
created these allotments. It was a set rate for each school. We took the dollar equivalent, $9 million, and pushed it into SSF. So now those that same dollar amount is more equitably distributed across all schools. So the dollars are the same, but based on, um, but you're getting that through SSF now. What we have done to ensure that schools are at least receiving the $30,000 we started with through cluster funds, and at least the teacher salary is incorporated that into our base allocation so that no school earns less than um, that amount. Okay, so so no school is, is, is losing based on that formula. There, it, it is just that some schools are Might getting more. Yeah are getting more. Okay, and specifically with reference to signature programming, are we continuing to faithfully and uh, completely fund needed signature program uh, so that we can get all of those schools online with whatever it is, whether it's it's STEM STEAM or IB or um, college and career pet prep, we are continuing to, to pay those costs, is that correct? We are continuing to allocate for the signature programs outside of SSF to ensure that there's a, the flat rate allocation is in place to ensure that schools can continue to buy that one FTE for the, to support the program and cover any costs that are specific to their program. So that has not been consolidated. Okay, I know that, that several schools will move to the next level of IB authorization in the next year and that gets more expensive Mm -hmm. at certain levels. So I just want to make sure we are continuing to cover that. As they progress uh, through, we do get those updates um, and we will move them through the tier if funds are available. Sometimes we might hold a school a year. I'm just setting up the stage for the future years. It might be that we have to hold a school at a certain phase if we don't have funds available to progress them forward. Um, or we might be able to progress them forward, but ask the schools to use their own allotments to kind of support that. Those are some of the decisions we might want to make in the future years as budgets begin to get a little bit tighter. But currently, yes, we are progressing schools through their tiers and we're keeping that same flat allotment in place. Okay, and one more question and then I'm done. And this I think will be a short one. On the next, uh, the next point in that right-hand column, what is contained in that 2.4 million for the Atlanta College and Career Academy? So it is not the SPLOST overhead, it is just the operational cost of running that school. So it is a principal, it's the teachers for the CTAE program, it's the operational cost of running that program, but it's not the facilities for the program. Okay, then I'm confused because the second sentence in that, in that point, in that block says it does not include facility improvements and other operational costs. That's correct. So the facility improvements was funded out of SPLOST. This is just the general fund component of running the program. Um, so I think I said operational, there's supply cost there's of, of running a CTAE program. And I think that's what I meant by the operations. Okay. But what's not housed here is like the, the SPLOST funded development of the site. Okay. Yeah. All right. But, but so a lot of this is probably is presumably personnel and yep. equipping classrooms and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's mostly personnel. So I think there are 17 teachers in the program. Um, I can double check that, but there is also a principal for the program. We have safety, it's, it's, it's like running a high school and there's a lot of fixed overhead um, for opening a, a high school site. That's what would be included in this cost. Okay, yep. thank you. I think no that's problem. all I've got. Thank you, Leslie. You're welcome, Jason. Um, quick question about the, um, back to Cynthia's thing. I was just trying to look it up online in the budget book. Um, wh at what point does, you know, we used to get the big book with all the sheets, mm -hmm. um, like 300 page or whatever. When does that come out? So after it's the actually budget's approved? To the tentative budget adoption for tonight. Um, it doesn't have all of our, um, backup documentation, like usually there's an organizational section which will talk through all of the organizational components. Um, but this, these are the budget documents, the individual department and school sheets. Okay. Um, as it's a 9.01. It's a 9.01 is the first attachment, general fund budget um, for TA with tentative adoption. Okay. Um, okay, it's not on the website right, proper yet. Okay, got it. Um, and then is the, 
when you were talking about the allocations for the um, for the turnaround, different turnaround levels being put into, is it just like a big chunk, a big bucket that goes to the partner schools or is it actually outlined? Is it called out differently in here? So it wouldn't be in, you won't see the partner's portion of the turnaround anywhere in here. You will see when we are uh, determining the allocation for the partner schools, a piece of their allocation is a percentage of the overall turnaround budget. So we look at the total turnaround budget that is going out to schools in central office, and there's a percentage allocation of that that goes into the partner school allocation. And then when they get their monthly check that's come out of their one account called partner schools, um, it includes that portion of turnaround. Okay, and I'm, I do apologize. I have not looked through this one yet. Um, but is, is there a, um, are there sheets in here though that do outline what like individually what goes to the charters and partners and whatnot? Yes, let me try to find that. Um, the partner schools and charter schools typically do have their own sheet, but oh, yep, it is actually the last sheet in here. It's slide 243. Um, and again, these are allocations that were, um, I'm not sure if these have been updated based on the state revenue decreases and some of the other changes that we made in place. I'll double check that. Okay. Um, but that's one of the things we were trying to verify over the last month as we were working to rebalance is recalculating based on the new local revenue plus share of fund balance, um, how the charters and partner schools will be earning their allocations for this upcoming year. Okay, but in terms of this, this is the lowest or the finest it gets broken down or yep. there, there's no other sheets that, okay. No, because that is just one line item contract amount. Um, there's one line item account in our operating system. Okay. Um, it's the contracts that predicate yeah. what that allocation, um, how that allocation is determined and our Office of Innovation uh, does that calculation for us. Yep, and then, okay. Um, and those contracts are on the innovation site, I'm mm -hmm. guessing. Okay, I'll look there. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Cynthia and Leslie. Um, Leslie, uh, Cynthia, do you have any additional questions? Because I think your hand is still up. Okay. She lowered her hand, so I think we're good there. Uh, thank you so much, Lisa. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Dr. Christopher? Great. <clears throat> Our next um, presentation is a closeout of the 2015-2020 strategic plan. Uh, Angela King-Smith will join me. Uh, she is the chief engagement officer and is often um, the person who ensures that we have all of our district-wide data and information uh, pulled together. And uh, she and her team are the masterminds behind a lot of the layout that you see for communication purposes, including uh, this summary report. Uh, over the last six years, uh, Atlanta Public Schools and its leadership team has worked strategically to address a multitude of challenges. And when I started in this district, uh, we were in the throes of uh, the cheating scandal and the uh, and the related um, uh, court case uh, that was following it, and today we're ending on COVID-19. So uh, it has been a very exciting uh, six years with a lot of other stuff in between. But be that as it may, uh, our work has never stopped. Um, we have uh, worked to address graduation rates, under-enrolled schools, low academic achievement, large achievement gaps. Um, community trust issues um, that was shattered by that scandal, um, thousands of um, students who were negatively affected by that scandal, and partners who had a lot of questions about whether or not they should continue to invest in Atlanta public schools. Um, our infrastructure needed uh, repair uh, and updating, 
And, uh, and there were too few uh, leaders in the district uh, who were um, skilled to be able to move a lot of the schools forward. And so there's a lot of uh, support for not just leaders, but teachers and support staff that needed to be addressed. And, and of course, I don't have to tell this board or the community about the longstanding inequities um, that Atlanta faces that often play out in the public school system. And uh, so um, even though we are in this global pandemic and it did necessitate the immediate uh, closure of uh, in-person instruction for our schools and, and a teleworking, teleschooling model for the entire district, uh, we were still uh, really pretty far into the school year uh, when that happened, uh, which allows us to still be able to close out the current strategic plan in preparation for the future. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Um, thank you. So uh, we're just going to, again, do the progress summary for the last uh, five years of the strategic plan. Uh, highlight any of the key performance measures with a little bit of information. Uh, we've done this every year, so we don't have to go back and rehash five years, but, um, but there are some highlights worth noting one more time. Uh, and uh, to give people a sense of the progress and some of the challenges that we still have facing us. Uh, our takeaway for this presentation is that you do have a stronger foundation. Uh, the APS I knew when I started in school year 2014-15 uh, is completely different to uh, the school year we're closing out on in 2020. And it's all for the better. Uh, you don't have to talk to many people to know that they really do feel like the culture has changed, uh, that we do have a child-centered agenda, um, that we have done better management of uh, just key business functions like uh, budget and uh, buses and 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 anything else you know that just you know kind of keeps the lights on and makes you a functioning uh, organization. But that we also I did a pretty significant lift in uh, ensuring that uh, we were uh, tying all of our work to an academic direction, a true north that was about children. Next slide. So this slide uh, kind of highlights uh, where we started. Um, some of you on this board, not all of you, will remember um, being in that room that had no windows. Uh, I think we were over at uh, one of our partner's offices and uh, we worked on a mission and a vision uh, along with the, the, the community, um, but we didn't have a lot of time. There was a lot of pressure to kind of get APS off the ground and ready to go. And so we aspire to be a high performing school district where students love to learn, educators inspire, families engage and the community trust the system. And every day we worked on a mission to create a caring culture of trust and collaboration to ensure that every child graduated ready for college and career. And we flipped the organizational chart on its head, putting families and students at the top, and putting the elected board and superintendent at the bottom. And that the, and that the leadership team was really pushing uh, a support structure uh, with partners and community on the side to really give APS the strength it needed uh, to build a stronger central office to support school-based leadership, to support teachers and other support staff so that students and families could be stronger. You gave us guiding principles around excellence, ethics, equity, and engagement. And while not perfect at every single turn, um, I think that, um, that we made headway in all four guiding principle categories. Next slide. Uh, so uh, in 2015, uh, if uh, uh, Cynthia Briscoe Brown uh, mentioned it about signature programming, uh, so we talk about that today, you know, as if uh, it's something that's a little normal and we're looking out for. But if you'll remember, we really didn't have that. We didn't have our clusters uh, developed. Uh, we didn't have governing teams. Um, we didn't have uh, uh, a programmatic approach that uh, was agreed upon from pre-K all the way to 12th grade. That became part of our application to the state to be a charter system operating model district. And in addition to those governing teams and signature programs and clusters, uh, we uh, mapped out uh, a system of autonomy and flexibility, clunky as it might be. Um, but the idea is that if you believe that the people in the front line know the children and the families the best, and give them the, uh, the resources, time, people, money, and decision-making authority to be able to do that. Um, part of that strategy included turnaround, uh, where we did um, some uh, bold ideas around rethinking uh, how we did our work, um, with whom we did that work, 
uh, that uh, ended up uh, creating a structure of partnership schools, um, as well as investing in existing leaders and clusters to be able to do their work. And we, as a team, adopted core values uh, that uh, were started with putting children and schools first. And, uh, and, it, and, and that was where we be began every day of our work to ensure that we were operating with that true north. Uh, and um, we uh, created, which was part of that early work, but an, an effort, um, again, a not perfect and not always uh, quantifiable at the levels that we wanted it to be, but, um, but it was a target 2020 initiative to address those students um, who were um, victims of the cheating scandal. So uh, those kids are still graduating and moving um, through Atlanta Public Schools, and, but we have offered them additional support uh, for, um, for them having gone through um, that level of um, trauma and um, lack of investment uh, by the district uh, led by other people who um, are not you know, on, this, on this board today. Or, or in the leadership roles in the administration. Uh, so um, in 2017, we started having conversations about leadership excellence and teaching um, excellence, um, which led us to uh, kind of the beginning of this school year as we were closing out, getting a, an approved equity policy, a profile of a graduate, and a vision for excellent schools, which will take you into the next um, uh, strategic plan and the next administration. Next slide, please. Great, and I've basically, I've just talked you through all of those things um, with the mission on the left and the um, outcome, uh, uh, the outcomes on the far right in blue, um, but, uh, but leading with uh, or ending with something that continues to be aspirational uh, to lift the district. We had four pillars in that strategic plan act that focused on academics, talent, systems and resources, and culture. Next slide. Next slide. So I'll walk you through each of those goal areas. I mean, y'all have seen these over time, but basically based on what the um, initiative was, you will see, which we've had in individual years, but we've pulled them all together so you can see all five years at one time. It starts in 2015, ends in 2019, but it talks you through the Georgia milestones, end of grade, think elementary, end of course, think secondary, especially high school, next slide. Again, um, we had other um, initiatives like pre-K enrollment, student attendance, the graduation rate and uh, participation, I mean, not participation, um, percentage of students scoring um, higher, three or higher on advanced placement tests, next slide. We also looked at improvements in curriculum instruction and assessment, being prepared for college, that's post-secondary, um, readiness on the back end of that book, um, of the bookshelves. Uh, you have kindergarten readiness and all the non-academic um, student supports like social emotional learning and ensuring that um, we are uh, supporting kids who needed behavioral in, in intervention um, uh, supports. Next slide, and mental health. Next slide, thank you. Talent. Uh, talent was the second um, pillar. And remember, we, we are an organization of people. Um, that's why our budget looks like it does. Uh, we um, uh, do programming, but it's delivered by teachers. And so investing in talent management was a big piece, but we began with um, a huge pay parity issue uh, that needed to be addressed, and you have chipped away successfully at that every single year of the strategic plan, and you have wrestled that bear to the ground. Um, but even though money is part of what is important to maintaining a high quality work staff, um, there are other things that we have to look at beyond compensation. And so you'll you'll think about professional learning. You'll you'll look at making sure they have good health care, making sure that their retirement is done right, making sure um, they have what they need to be able to do their job, that their voices matter, that they have a good um, principal, a leader, or a department head. Um, but we've increased um, compensation by $54 million and established leadership development opportunities um, across the board. Uh, teacher vacancies have decreased. Last year, we started with fewer than seven teacher vacancies. Um, making us number one in the metro area. 
for um, being able to start a school year uh, almost 100% fully staffed in that area. And we've done that with 10 or less for six consecutive years. Um, we've increased compensation, like I said, at $54 million, which is no small amount of money, um, because once you do those raises and increases, you carry them with you for the rest of time. So just know these investments are real and that um, you've made a huge difference in the lives of, um, of our staff, especially our teaching, uh, our teaching staff, which is half of the 6,000 employees uh, in the organization, as well as support staff, the other 2,000. Um, we've established partnerships, uh, new ones to help build positions. Um, we've done a lot around improving uh, teacher quality uh, and, um, and also um, leadership development to make sure that we're growing our own and investing in people in hopes that what we have invested in continues um, to pay off for APS as an investment. And our substitute, substitute fill rate, um, in, in which was uh, low when we started, um, has improved dramatically by 10 percentage points up to 98% uh, in this past school year. Next slide. In systems and, uh, in systems and resources, uh, a large part of our work here is uh, around uh, making sure that uh, systemically, we were making changes uh, that needed to be made in funding models and how we reorganized departments, um, to how we manage uh, instructional technology, whether it's um, distribution or um, creating the right platforms for teaching and learning, uh, and also student safety. We uh, originally used to outsource our police, our policing. Uh, we have brought that in-house and have uh, a fully staffed um, uh, school resource officer team with our with a chief of police um, who's all specialized and were recruited uh, to embrace our culture around social emotional learning and um, and have policing be the last thing we do but do more around coaching supporting um, helping kids uh, who uh, need a lot of additional supports in school um, when um, even though um, even though like neighborhoods and things of that sort uh, may not necessarily reinforce the expectations that we have. So we've um, really built that up inside the system. Uh, and, uh, and one uh, large part of uh, systems and resources is of course around construction and facilities. This is where uh, we passed a SPLOST uh, to continue to invest in the renovation, um, the maintenance and, um, and the building of uh, facilities in APS. And, uh, and I will say, having worked in two other districts and certainly have been all around this country looking at school districts, Atlanta really has um, beautiful facilities. And we, um, not all of them are you know, completely done. As you know, we still have spots to spend, um, but this is a city that uh, creates a beautiful learning environments for children. And our community has been a great partner with that um, because they vote on this and generate the one penny sales tax that makes this possible. It generates over $2 billion for the metro area for school districts, some school districts to share. Um, our portion of that is about $500 million. Uh, and, um, and you are currently spending um, a, a SPLOS right now and have a couple of years left before you would go back to voters again. Next slide. Um, in finance, a couple of things that y'all really uh, wanted to see happen and where we feel like we have been uh, successful, it was to reduce central administration. So you will see uh, us moving from almost 7% to something closer to 5%, uh, but to increase uh, resources to direct instruction and to schools. And so I think we have um, uh, been successful in that area uh, to redirect those, um, those resources. Uh, we uh, very early on started what we call BFAC, a budget and finance advisory committee that has uh, stakeholders from all different groups uh, advising our CFO and raising tough questions. Uh, and, uh, and, and we continue to do that. I think that that is a critical part of our budget process that has made us uh, more successful for our communities on leaning in with us. Uh, we have a, a public website, we hold budget meetings, um, public hearings. I think that um, our budget commission work has been very strong over the years and, um, and has led us to successful budgets that are balanced um, for the last six years. 
And no matter what COVID-19 does, uh, we are gonna still have a balanced budget when we close out um, in preparation for fiscal year 2021. Um, we've had school closures and mergers and program changes, um, some of them quite controversial, uh, others, uh, you know, much, you know, needed and not as controversial, but, um, but all in, uh, all of the mergers and closures that we said we would do, we did them, we did them on time, we reopened programs. Uh, well, and and I think that um, there are many great examples of that work. I, some that come straight to mind um, is uh, are the you know the partnerships we have with um, Kendesi and Kip and um, Purpose Built. And on the other hand, I look at our internal work, like at Hollis Innovation Academy, um, the uh, the the rethinks um, that we have on on some of our. Um, uh, middle schools and high schools, uh, especially around signature programming, um, have also been successful. And there are just some principals who have made a career. Um, uh, uh, Robin out of Burgess Peterson, who's now at BAMO, um, and and others who've just done a great job of uh, making it making it uh, our traditional schools and our um, innovative schools um, stand out uh, over these last. A few years as we've implemented this work. And I would be remiss if I didn't talk about Harper Archer um, that has received a lot of attention, but it is a great story of how hard this work is and, um, and how important it is to have a great leader and principal, uh, no matter what the design is, and, and a great team of, um, of educators willing to follow that principle and team up with them. Uh, in, in IT, uh, we've done a lot of work around devices and things got accelerated a lot this year, uh, more than ever before. I think in all five years, it feels like we have not moved as much as we have in the last, you know, less than five months. And so a lot of distribution, a lot of hotspots, a lot of um, smart, smartphones and laptops and partnerships um, over the years, but um, under COVID-19, uh, we have really uh, lifted, um, uh, just lifted this area considerably. Uh, there's a lot of replacement that happens in technology, uh, little things like switches and cables and things of that sort, but big things like rethinking entire platforms um, for learning, uh, redoing um, uh, contracts with providers that weren't working uh, as well as our teachers wanted them to. We have to provide professional learning to all of our staff on those things, as well as um, engage our students. And our students have done a really uh, well over the last few years um, in technology fairs and, uh, and in um, uh, demonstrating that they're getting prepared for the future. Uh, and, and, and it also, I think like COVID-19 has unveiled the gross inequities in uh, technology and IT as well as a community, whether it's connectivity or just access to quality devices, um, this is the next frontier of, um, of work that APS will have to keep its eyes on if it wants to actually have a workforce and children um, prepared for the future. Uh, next slide. Uh, safety and security, I've covered facilities, I feel like I've covered, um, and then <clears throat> we've had a, a more detailed you know, conversation about um, systems, but I will say that this was a big year for APS as we um, upgraded massive systems that were um, just completely band-dated and bubble-gummed um, when we first started around um, payroll and accounting and making sure that um, our global HR systems speak to our, our financial systems. Um, those things are really huge for a billion-dollar business like ours. Uh, and it takes years to roll out. And, um, and I was glad to see that we finally made it, you know, over the hump um, this past year to get, uh, to get our final um, uh, global HR system uh, co arguably completed um, with the last uh, big lift that we needed to do in the investment. So in that sense, I feel like the internal um, uh, intra, intra um, structure um, is much stronger today than it was six years ago. Next slide. And so last but not least, um, a wise man you know, once said, um, if you do not have a good culture, it will eat your strategy for breakfast every single day, no matter how beautiful your plan is or how glossy the paper is. 
or how pretty the pictures are. So uh, culture was a big uh, issue for Atlanta public schools. Culture arguably broke the trust between um, Atlanta public schools and its, and its public, uh, whether the people sent kids to APS or were taxpayers or um, community members or visitors. We had a terrible reputation uh, nationally and globally and certainly in our local community. Uh, and we've done a lot to improve that. It was um, anchored in a strength-based philosophy um, that helped people reset their mindset uh, to focus on um, what's strong and not what's wrong, and but to still own up to the things that we didn't do right, even if you didn't make the mistake yourself. And so uh, over time, um, you can see here that um, customer satisfaction that means our school leaders, the people who receive services um, from, um, from uh, central office uh, uh, have um, improved over time um, in some areas. Uh, in others like uh, ethics, we have dramatically improved, but overall we've seen staff engagement go up from 29% to 48% in 2020. Um, and we also um, see that play out in our community uh, our families are with us more now than ever. Um, they, we increased social media engagement. Um, we've uh, re-established partnerships uh, with um, partners who had all kind of taken a, back, a step back away from APS. Um, and we've raised um, over uh, $80 million um, after establishing an Office of Partnerships and Development. And so, uh, so that is good news for APS. Again, um, a totally different day in this space. Um, and that has made a big difference for all of us. Next slide. Um, so a lot of our strengths-based um, organizational culture uh, is, um, is, is measured. We do that in partnership with Gallup. And, uh, and they do have a, uh, they have reported that we have had statistically significant growth um, since uh, 2014. Uh, our, our organization was in the fifth, um, uh, the, in the um, fifth, um, uh, per, uh, where, where am I? Um, yes, we were in the um, fifth percentile for, um, for um, staff, for staff engagement and um, and satisfaction, and now we are trending above uh, the nation for like size, um, like like organizations, and now scoring at um, at the sixty fourth. Uh, so what we are seeing as part of that is that um, things like misconduct um, as as an employee is down. Um, it has decreased. Uh, we see less uh, teacher absences. Um, we're seeing a retention of our novice teachers. Um, we're seeing um, overall effectiveness in the improvement of um, teacher retention. Uh, workplace satisfaction has increased and, uh, and, and there's less uh, ethical issues in the district. Uh, we continue to do the, um, the assessment every year of all of our employees. They do a mandatory training and, uh, and an assessment. And in previous years, we have had to let people go, um, especially in the first and second years. But since then, um, it's been 100% um, uh, uh, training rate and participation rate. And, uh, and anyone who doesn't do it uh, cannot work for Atlanta Public Schools and, um, and they are terminated or their contract is terminated. Uh, we have uh, worked on uh, a disparity study. Uh, it started with um, procurement and um, and SQUAS, but as the board knows, uh, we are growing that, and that will continue to grow to cover every contract in APS to support um, minority and women businesses. And then, um, and we have updated our performance appraisal process for non-instructional employees, um, um, improving all of those things um, uh, throughout the last six years. Next slide. So um, one part of improving, you know, the uh, the relationship with the public is for them to have transparency and information. 
I think that APS does probably the most aggressive um, data rollout, the good, the bad, the ugly, every single time on any single um, assessment or uh, data point. Um, and, and, and I think that is in part why we've seen such a steady increase in, uh, in the, our followers and people who um, are, are you know, paying attention to what APS is doing and, um, and, are, and feel like they can be engaged with us. Uh, we've launched apps. Um, we've, um, uh, you know, raised not just money, but in-kind goods and services and, and certainly um, spread out our partnership uh, net to include not just nonprofits and corporate, but philanthropic and government and, and a lot of other folks in between. Next slide. So uh, you will now uh, be transitioning to a new strategic plan, uh, which is incredibly exciting. This one um, is anchored in equity. And so, uh, so the, the, the lift um, that will um, need to happen you know, in the future, everyone is well aware of. You want excellence, you want equity, and you want every child to have access to a choice of life. And so um, the, you know, so in summary for the 2015 to 2020 um, strategic plan, there's still a lot of work to do around closing achievement gaps, like I said, equity, um, making sure that you have all the right people in the right seats on the bus. Um, there's gonna be a lot of work in facility master planning um, that is still ahead, um, but, um, but we were very pleased um, with the results of all the work leading to the next strategic plan which did include about 1,400 people responding, responding to surveys, 13 community meetings, eight board of education meetings, three retreats on it, um, and, and finally a vote. So, um, so the good news is that, you know, APS is really, you know, still on top of um, staying focused, keeping children as its North Star. And, and I think um, building on the outcomes of the old strategic plan and embracing uh, a future that's um, anchored in equity is gonna be an exciting and wonderful time um, for anyone um, who's in Atlanta, but especially if you have your kids in school and APS, um, I still think there's a very bright future ahead and that people are gonna work hard to deliver that for, um, for kids, um, for parents, for our taxpayers, and for the city of Atlanta. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the board, and that concludes my report. Um, Angela King-Smith is also available to answer any questions. And um, I'll just close by saying um, the detailed scorecard and summary report, which is over, I think, 88 pages. So you can, you can relive the last five years of that strategic plan by detail to see how we grew pre-K or which schools closed and opened when and what were the new programming. It's all detailed and you can read it. And, um, and relive it again uh, if you want to. But again, it's a, it's a great way to segue into the next strategic plan and also codify what has been done so that if people ever have questions, you can point them back to that, um, that information so, um, so that it is um, part of the uh, institutional and um, institutional, hi institutional history of APS and, and and is public, like transparent, uh, which is something that was hard to find uh, when we all started um, six years ago. And now I think every year has been well documented for, um, for, for uh, in prosperity. So anyway, I, I will close there, answer any questions. And, uh, and that is our last presentation for the work session. Thank you so much, Dr. Sarfin, and thank you for your leadership uh, over the last five years uh over the six well five years of the strategic plan six years total but five years um uh, over this strategic plan um i i think that uh it has been a job well done and uh you have done the work that we asked you to do uh six years ago uh but that we codified five years ago with this strategic plan so uh greatly appreciate uh, the efforts of you and your team. Um, we have a fantastic team uh, that has poured their heart and soul into this work and uh, the results are clear. So thank you. With that, uh, Nancy. 
Yep. Um, I want to echo Jason. It's been a long road uh, for six years and it had a very rocky start and it has a very smooth finish. And you and your team have been amazing having been around for a while. Um, I don't know how we could have gotten it done any better. So I do want to say thank you to you and everyone at the CLL because it's a, it's a team effort. It's not one person and um, I appreciate it so much. So thank you. And thank you. And I'll, um, and I, I would like to shout out uh, David Jernigan, the deputy, the former deputy superintendent for Atlanta Public Schools. Um, uh, Angela King Smith, who is uh, also here uh, on, to support me in this presentation and is on video. Uh, Lisa Bracken, the CFO, Larry Hoskins, our Chief Operations Officer, Bill Kareech over um, accountability. Of course, Nina Gupta and um, Glenn Brock, who started with us um, both out of Nelson Mullins, but have been great general counsels and, um, and good thought partners uh, as we have really gone through a lot uh, in this district on legal matters. Um, and, um, uh, and so anyway, I just, uh, I just wanted to be sure that I have always said this, I don't think anybody does it alone. We have great teachers, great principals. I'm watching so many APs um, grow up and step up into the roles. Um, our bus drivers and cafeteria workers and SROs, all the support staff. I mean, it's really been wonderful. Um, so I'm, um, I'm happy for APS. I think we've had a great team that's done a lot of hard work and, um, and Atlanta will always um, you know, benefit from that. And, and the whole point is to make sure that kids have a choice built life, but that is directly tied to having a quality workforce. So, um, so I'm hoping they stay and, um, and invest in Atlanta because I do think this, this board uh, for the last six years absolutely um, along with our administration has invested in the future of this city. Ishe? Yes, I just want to echo, um, as I was reading through the, the pre, you know, looking through the presentation and just reflecting on everything, it was very, you know, it is very tearful because we have come a long way and, there, you know, everything that was presented, none of this wasn't in place. And I just truly appreciate your leadership and leadership of everyone um, and the advocacy and the fight and the tiredness and the long days and long nights and the long years just to get this work done. We've done some really great work and I'm just honored to have worked with every last one of you guys and have had the opportunity to serve alongside of everybody here um, because we, you know, I look through this and I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's just a really proud moment of, a, you know, Five year. I've never been with an organization where I began and ended um, a strategic plan and is part of bring another. And so you truly see where a vision started, you know, six years, you know, six years ago and where we are now and what we, what will lead us into the future. And so I just want to thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kasarfin, and thank everyone um, for all of the hard work. All of us are, you know, I think, yeah, all of us are new except for maybe what, who Larry and a few others, but um, I just appreciate everyone's leadership, your brilliance, your intelligence, hard work, um, riding it through, pushing back, uh, making it very, very clear that we are all about Atlanta, you know, about we're all team kids and I've always been, um, whether you know whether you are on the south side or the north side, it didn't matter. And I just really appreciate that from everyone, and truly appreciate this presentation about all the great work that we, you know, that the we've been able to to do and what the team has done over the last five years. Just wanted to say that and thank you guys from the bottom of my heart. And well, well done. So excited for the next level. Um, I will say when I ran, you know, like this is what I when I when I urge my office this is the work I wanted to be a part of and I'm just so amazed to be a part of a group of people and be had the opportunity to interact with everyone here to get this done and I really appreciate you guys for setting us on a solid foundation that's going to really lead us into a solid future for our children so thank you thank you Ishe I appreciate it and um and I just you know and part of that like original original team 
Uh, she's also uh, retired again, Pam Hall. I wanted to Pam make sure Hall. I said thank you to Pam <laughs> yeah. and Sky Duckett as well. Um, he's stepped into her shoes, yeah. big shoes to fill. Um, but, uh, but again, just, just, there are a lot of people, like I said, they've come and made them, you know, really did the big lift in the mark. Um, hey, Jaden. Uh, so <laughs> he looks so grown. Uh, also, that baby wasn't here when we got started. Right. So, <laughs> I was uh, going to say thing. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I just, it's, it's, it's been a growth, lots of growth, but, um, but I do think, you know, you're right. It's a, it's a great start for a bright, bright future. All right. I think, uh, thank you for that, Ishe. I need to be rocking my APS board shirt too, along with you and Pierre. Um, anything else? I feel like we have to uh, give Angela King Smith, Dr. Angela King Smith, an uh, opportunity to say something, make a cameo appearance. She she is the one who, uh, God bless her, I say this to, to a lot of folks, uh, had to put together the the new one as well, the new strategic plan as well, and work diligently. And we appreciate her and, and her team for that uh, because that took a lot of di digesting <laughs> for, for her to, to help us put it together. So Angela, do you have anything? Thank you. Um, I just want to say that it's been uh, a pleasure. It's been a lot of hard work. Like Ishe, I've never uh, had the, the opportunity to work from the plan uh, when it's being developed all the way through to its conclusion and to be able to see all the hard work that the administration, the board, the teachers, the leaders have all poured into this um, strategic plan. We lived by this plan and everything from our new employee orientation to our expanded cabinet meetings, our community meetings. We led with the mission and vision of the district and um, we brought the community along and engaged them in the conversation about how do we live our mission and vision in our, in our work. Um, and that included our GO teams, our charter system work and um, all of the things that supported it. So I just wanna say um, thank you uh, to all the folks that helped to support and built this plan um, and to all the folks that helped to implement and execute all the work that's happened in this plan. Um, to Dr. Karstarfin for her, her leadership and, and, and realizing that you know, it's important that you have a strong culture um, to support the strategy because without that it, it doesn't really it doesn't really work um, and all of all of the folks that have helped to make this plan a reality in in our schools um, and you know day to day that's what what brings a plan to life it wasn't a plan on the shelf it was a plan that we lived um, and I anticipate that the new plan uh, that's focused on equity and um, our work around that, uh, will also come to life over the next five years. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Starfin and, and um, Dr. King Smith uh, for that. Um, I think we are now prepared to move into executive session. Madam General Counsel, is there a reason to enter into executive session? Uh, Mr. Chair, yes, the board needs to consider a personnel matter. Great. Can I have a motion to enter into executive session to discuss matters involving personnel? So moved. Second. second. It's been properly moved by Cynthia Briscoe Brown, seconded by Ishe Collins. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any, oppo any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, as a reminder, we will be. Um, retreating into executive session, uh, the meeting will stop being broadcast uh, online and then we will come back uh, 
once we're done uh, at 6 p.m. to begin the budget hearing, the community hearing, and the legislative session. Thank you so much.